Let's, Let's begin. All right, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Jeff Kahn. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so while you're all getting um, food and trying to get settled, I think we have more people than seats, which is always a, a great thing. But maybe people can move to the, what is that, my right, your left, to make room on the aisle for people to sit down if there are any empties. So um, as Ruth said, we're, we're really pleased to kick off the seminar series with uh, what is a very hot topic, obviously. Over the last a number of weeks, the Ebola outbreak has uh, been much in the news and consumed, I'm sure, many people in the room and a number of people on the, on the panel um, in various uh, professional respects. We have uh, three panelists who will offer very different and we hope um, equally enlightening uh, perspectives on the Ebola outbreak. They each will speak for 10 minutes. I'm going to be pretty strict on time so that we have an opportunity to, dis to discuss the issues um, with you all as a group. The order will be as follows, and the way this will go, each will speak uh, in turn, and then we'll save the questions for after all three of the panelists have presented. So sitting to my immediate left is Trish Pearl who is a professor in both the Department of Medicine in the Medical School and in the Department of Epidemiology in the School of Public Health. Um, she will talk a little bit about the disease, um, protective measures for Ebola, as well as therapy and potential vaccine. Next to her is Tim Roberton, who is about to finish this year, I understand, in the doc DRPH program. Uh, he will talk about his very recent perspective on the ground in West Africa, uh, working with the American Red Cross in um, helping them understand the uh, effects of trust and mistrust uh, in emergency uh, outbreak context. I think I got it pretty close. And next to him is my colleague, uh, Professor Nancy Cass, who is faculty in both the Berman Institute of Bioethics and in the Department of Health Policy and Management in the School of Public Health. Um, you may have heard her and Tim both this morning on WYPR uh, talking about their various uh, perspectives related to the Ebola outbreak. Nancy has thought a lot about public health and ethics and has been quite a lot in the news of late discussing the ethical issues raised by the Ebola outbreak and the uh, therapies that may or may not be effective and available. So I think with that I'm going to stop to give us a lot of time. It's now 12.15. I'm going to start the clock. Trish, you're up, and we will um, take it from there. So thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being on the panel. Looking forward very much to what we hear. OK, well, welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming. I see a lot of my infectious disease colleagues, so I'll be reaching out for your expertise. Um, I just, as a disclosure, want everyone here to know that I'm not an ethicist. I do clinical infectious disease, and I'm trained as a healthcare epidemiologist, and will offer my perspectives that way. Um, that being said, this is one of several infectious diseases that has been associated with a lot of ethical issues. Um, Ten years ago, we had SARS. Uh, we then had H1N1, we've had H7N9, we've had MERS-CoV, and a lot of the issues that we're going to be talking about actually resonate very much with this current outbreak. Uh, <clears throat> I have been charged with giving you the ABCs of Ebola. So Ebola was named after the Ebola River, which is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This virus was discovered and described in 1976. Uh, by David Heyman and several other groups. It is an RNA virus in the phylovirus family, and it causes what we call a viral hemorrhagic fever. Um, this is a zoonotic disease, and the reservoir of the virus is still unclear, although we think that part of this is the fruit bat. I will not try and give you its scientific name. Uh, but they are part of the natural host. And this is what we call an epizootic cycle that shows you the relationship, and I can't actually, well, maybe I can here, um, of bats to bats to bats, and then the relationship of these animals with at least um, uh, primates, which we think are very important, as well as potentially other am animals that are um, ultimately consumed 
by people. There are several uh, types of Ebola. They all have names. Um, and the point I really would just want to make is that they are similar out of this group. They are all found in Africa except for Ebola reston that was described in the Philippines. And that is the one virus that is thought to be exclusively uh, causes, causing disease in animals. This is actually from a paper that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, and what it does is it lists to you all of the known Ebola outbreaks, including the current one, which is at the bottom. It shows you um, not only the country that it, this occurred in, but also the number of cases and the deaths, um, as well as the species of virus. What I'd like to point out is at the bottom of this, the current outbreak, uh, and now they are estimating anywhere from 10 to 20,000 cases ultimately. The mortality is currently around 50%. And what you can see is this is the um, EBOV virus. So this is a well-known species that has been seen in multiple other outbreaks. Uh, this is actually taken from the European CDC website. And I just thought it was a nice picture to show you where the current outbreak is distributed. And what you can see in there is that there are these bar graphs that kind of give you a sense of the magnitude of cases. Currently, Liberia is the most heavily affected of these countries, but there are also cases in uh, Sierra Leone, Guinea, um, and potentially um, and Nigeria. <coughs> Here is what we call an epidemic curve. Along the x-axis, you have time. And along the y-axis, you have the number of cases. And you can see that this particular outbreak probably was smoldering from um, earlier this summer and clearly has escalated very quickly over time. And the, d the number of cases actually changes. What I was hearing yesterday was over 2,000. And I just think we have to recognize that this is a, a, um, a in evolution outbreak. And as surveillance improves, as well as technology and diagnostics improve, we will be finding more and more cases. Uh, <clears throat> here you can see that, as I was just saying, that Liberia is the most uh, heavily affected of these current countries. Um, there are cases in um, several other countries. The case in Senegal was actually imported from uh, one of the other affected countries. The case fatality ratio varies anywhere from 33% up to 64%. And what's also important is it varies depending on what site you're cared for. And in areas where there is improved medical care, the fatality rate decreases. Here are the symptoms um, of, of the particular dis of Ebola. Uh, my basic point is really that I just want everyone to recognize these are very nonspecific symptoms, especially early on. And this could really be influenza or any other disease. And in fact, when we think about this in a febrile person returning from Africa, our differential diagnosis is malaria, malaria, malaria then maybe typhoid fever, dengue, and then some other things before we actually think of viral hemorrhagic fever. So there are a lot of causes of these nonspecific symptoms in people who are coming back from this part of the world. Uh, here you go, and you can see that um, not only is the mortality high, but the morbidity is high. And I just wanted to show you not only the number of cases, but the deaths over time. Now, I thought I'd take a minute or two just to talk about risk to healthcare workers. One of the salient features of this particular outbreak that is actually very similar to SARS and MERS-CoV is that there's been a large proportion of healthcare workers that have been impacted. Now, what's particularly interesting about this one is that you need to recognize that Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone um, have fewer than 0.1 physicians per 1,000 people, a very, very low number of people. So these are poorly resourced countries. They have come out of a civil war, and they are some of the poorest countries in the world. 
The risk to healthcare workers or to the few healthcare workers that have been there um, is really related to direct contact with blood and bodily fluids. We do not think that this is transmitted by breathing or respiratory at all. It's really contact with blood and um, body fluids. Most of this has actually occurred within not only the healthcare setting but the home, and I'll describe that in a minute. In terms of things we worry about in the healthcare workers, most of the transmission has been associated with no personal pr protective equipment. And this is one of the things we'll be talking about. There has been very poor supply chain and access to what you need to make healthcare workers feel safe. Because of that, there's also been reuse of personal protective equipment. And if you've read the Wall Street Journal, et cetera, people have been reusing gloves and all sorts of of things. There is cross-contamination when you remove your personal protective equipment. So when you just think of the pictures, and I'll show you some of what people are wearing, when you try and take this off, especially if you're tired and hot and sweaty, there's obviously a risk for cross-contamination. Needle sticks are another source of transmission in healthcare worker uh, workers, and there has been also um, uh, uh, transmission by actually contaminating yourself with needles. And then there have been reports in the laboratory. I've talked to the behavioral issues, the fatigue and the heat. I would also just like to point out that there are the nurse to patient ratios and the physician to patient ratios are clearly inadequate, which means that you have increased um, strain on these healthcare workers. Now, how do you make healthcare workers feel safe? So the in first thing is that the precautions that we've offered that are very simple, this is an outbreak from, uh, from 1995, and what you can see is that where the arrow is, when they implemented precautions, there was actually no additional transmission once you've gone through the incubation period to healthcare workers except for one person who reported actually contaminating her conjunctiva when she was removing her PPE. So we actually have very good data that very simple precautions work. What we do know is we have to make sure you take them off safely. And so resources need to be in place to make sure that not only do you have what you need, but you can take it off. The questions that are addressed that are um, in healthcare workers are, are there adequate supplies? And then people look at these pictures and they get the sense that more is better. And there's a lot of effort that's getting put into getting more and more PPE as opposed to focusing on do we just have what we actually need to make people feel safe? In terms of patient care, I'd like to make two comments, or three actually. One is that the data coming from Médecins Sans Frontières is that the use of intensivists in Guinea decreased mortality to under 50%. So we know that access to trained specialists actually does improve outcomes. I'd also point out that six healthcare workers have been evacuated from the region. No other people have been evacuated, but healthcare workers have been evacuated, which makes us recognize the issues of, of um, sharing of care. And then finally, I just want to briefly say that everyone's heard about access to vaccine. This is looking at vaccine. It looks like there are vaccines that work, but even if we get them in November, to healthcare workers. Is that going to be too much too late? So I'm getting shoot off the stage. So I just like to end by saying this is a lethal disease. Prevention is complicated by supply chain funding and politics. And that while the vaccine, and I didn't talk about ZMAP, are promising, safety and efficacy needs to be established and established quickly. Thank you. Sticking to time, I very much appreciate it. We all do. So, um, Tim, you're up. Okay. Thanks, Jeff, and thank you, Trish, and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, I, like Trish, I don't consider myself an ethicist, and I'm not a clinician, so it's a little bit daunting coming here and speaking to you all here in the hospital. But um, 
I think what I want to stress in my key message is the importance of public health measures to control uh, this outbreak because while um, you know, treatment issues are vitally important and the promise of uh, a vaccine is exciting, what's going to stop this outbreak is by working with, uh, with communities at the village level to help people protect themselves by not spreading the disease. Um, and I'm going to talk now about some qualitative research I did in Guinea in July with the Red Cross on the ground who have uh, hundreds of volunteers who are going out into villages and trying to educate people about Ebola and what they can do to pr protect themselves. So, uh, a little bit of background. So actually, Jeff said it's the American Red Cross. It was actually the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies um, who have an ongoing relationship with the School of Public Health to do research in emergencies. So this is part of a broader collaborative agreement to do research uh, on emergencies. Um, I went myself with another doctoral student, um, Clementine Fu, and we were sort of uh, led by Gilbert Burnham, who's here today in the audience. We were in uh, Guinea, we went to Conakry and then Gekudu in the south of Guinea, which is where the outbreak started, and we were there for about two weeks at the end of July. So that's actually now four, five, six weeks ago. So I want to stress that things may have changed a lot since then. So the, so the information I'm presenting today is from, from that period. Just a quick, quick overview of our research methods. Um, the goal was really qualitative research to capture the experiences of volunteers, staff, and community members, and to provide recommendations for this outbreak, but also to learn for future outbreaks. At the time we went there, I don't think anyone expected uh, the outbreak to be as large or as significant as it is now. So it's sort of, it's interesting to think about that now. We're only there for those two weeks. Who knows what's gonna happen by the end of this outbreak? Our focus was on the community-based activities with volunteers and community members, and we did interviews, focus groups, and document review. So perhaps the first thing to say, just to situate us all, is what is the Red Cross doing and what are all the other people doing there on the ground? Because it's hard to really get a picture of what's happening on the ground when you read the stories and things like that. So the Guinea Red Cross in Guinea and it's similar in Sierra Leone and Liberia, but there are some differences. I'm going to be talking about Guinea. Uh, their main role in this is to do communication and social, social mobilization with, um, through their volunteer network with villagers, um, to do dead body management. So if somebody dies in the community, uh, Red Cross will send a team out to that village, usually four people, and they'll go with a pickup truck and some protective gear, and they'll go out, talk to the family, and work with that family to bury the body in such a way that is, um, you know, safe. Um, also, if somebody dies in a treatment centre, the Red Cross will take that body back to the village and um, bury the body back there. So that's quite a, it's quite a technical role for what are actually volunteers. And then they also do disinfection. So if somebody is sick and goes to a treatment centre, uh, Red Cross will send a team back out and they'll disinfect the house um, so that the family is safe. Other key activities are coordination, which has been done by the Ministry of Health and with support from WHO, surveillance and contact tracing, which are vital for this um, to control the outbreak. Um, same players, but with support from CDC and MSF. And then the treatment centres. So when I was there in Guinea, there were three tra treatment centres in, uh, in Guinea, all being run by MSF. So that's different from in, say, Sierra Leone, where there were government facilities looking after Ebola patients. So I've got three big picture kind of topics or themes which I wanted to share with you, which are kind of my own reflections, really, um, and I hope will provide a counter to the clinical discussion around uh, treatment and, and potential uh, vaccines. So the first point is, is just to really step back and recognise what it means to be diagnosed with Ebola or to come down uh, with a fever. So... One anecdote from the field that somebody told us was that um, this was a healthcare worker talking about another healthcare worker in one of the clinics in Guinea. So this is, I, I think it was a man, health worker, realised that he himself was getting sick in his clinic. And um, he'd, one day he realised that, no, this could, be, this could be Ebola. And so what he did was he left his clinic, he locked the clinic at the end of the day, he sent a message to his family 
and he went straight to the MSF treatment center where he later died. Um, and so thinking about this anecdote makes me realize, you know, to tell somebody that as soon as you get sick or there's sign of fever, that you've got to go to a treatment center is serious business. And, you know, how would we all manage and cope in that kind of situation? And if that's our key message to communities, and really that's one of the key prevention messages, is get treatment as soon as you have these symptoms. You know, do we expect that people will immediately pack up and go to the treatment centre, knowing that perhaps they'll never see their family again? So it's different, say, from other communicable disease control efforts where it's like, you know, get immunised, uh, have a vaccination, come for a checkup, these kind of things. This is, this is serious business. So um, I think it's important to keep that in mind. Also, the implications for people's uh, cultures and customs there. So one of the other big messages uh, is that people should bury bodies differently to how they're ordin ordinarily burying them. So in that, where we were, uh, there was a cultural group called the Kissy uh, cultural group there, and they have a practice of cleaning a body and washing it, which involves many people from the family and sometimes transporting the body so other people can see it. Now, as you can imagine, you know, a, a person is most infectious at the time of their death. So this is, you know, um, could cause real problems for spread. But just simply saying to people, okay, you can't do that anymore, you know, that's complicated. And so we've got to realize that what we're asking people to do is to change behaviors in ways which are really profound. Okay, second point. Uh, so this, is, this builds on what I said before. How do we build the trust and support of local communities and health workers? So the villages where this outbreak is being spread are villages which are very poor and, and rural with people that don't often, sometimes don't often go to the health facility, a, a health facility. Um, and as I said on the radio this morning, there's, there are villages where perhaps there's not even a car in the village, okay, or maybe a couple of motorbikes. So to all of a sudden have a team of people drive in with four, white four-wheel drives like this and, you know, put on personal protective gear and start walking around their house. That's a quite a, you know, that's an extraordinary event for that village. And unfortunately, that's led to a lot of rumour and mistrust uh, between communities and the agencies working on the ground there. So much so that in some villages, people have simply, you know, bunkered down and are not letting anyone into their village. So Red Cross is using strategies like trying to find people who once were from that village, who are now maybe working in the capital, to go back as kind of emissaries to, to sort of open the door slowly, slowly, slowly. Or maybe, you know, just sending somebody there to chat to meet with the village chief and just talk about the issue. But this process takes, takes time. And, um, you know, we can't overlook it when we say, oh, we just need support, we need to get in there. Again. We've got to remember that we've slowly got to build trust of these communities. My third and final point, again builds on this, is how do we do that? How do we build trust of villages, you know, when this craziness is going on, when we've got serious, uh, you know, when the implications of these measures are so serious? Uh, there are many ways to do this. We've recently just been analysing our data around communications. How do we communicate effectively with people? And in, from one of the, the CAP studies that was done actually in Sierra Leone, but I think is relevant for Guinea, is the importance of volunteers going door to door talking to people. If someone gets sick, you know, that person maybe go to the treatment centre, but then a, a team of volunteers is sent back to talk to the family about what that means for them, um, how they can protect themselves, that kind of thing. And the people who are doing that on the ground in Guinea uh, volunteers, unskilled, maybe they've worked on previous ep epidemics before as volunteers, but they're quite young and, you know, a lot of them are students. And here they are, some would say, you know, at the, the real forefront of this outbreak and the ones we've got to rely on to, to stop this um, uh, epidemic. So I just wanted to highlight their role and perhaps say, you know, when we're talking about ethics and the support to, to healthcare workers coming from America, or other healthcare workers on the ground, we shouldn't forget the hundreds of volunteers who are also going there in villages, talking with people who can or may be effective, um, collecting bodies, that sort of thing, which is equally dangerous um, sometimes to working in a treatment centre. So, there are my three points. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah. Thanks, Tim.
Professor Cass, do you have slides too? Okay, great. Um, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Alan. Um, so I guess I'll um, start my disclaimer that I'm not an infectious disease specialist and I haven't been to West Africa this summer. Um, so we're each going to do our best and we're going to work together, which is probably going to be um, constructive in the big picture as well. So. Um, this outbreak, like a lot of other outbreaks, certainly those of us who worked on HIV 20 years would say the same thing, have raised a multitude of ethics issues in almost every piece of the response of prevention, of treatment, of people, of local, of global. Here is a partial laundry list of the things that I could fit on a slide, but I probably could have done um, several slides. Things like, why didn't the world pay more attention? Do more people have a duty to go? How can we care for the people who do commit to going? Should those Americans have received the Z-map? Why didn't the Africans get the Z-map? When we do decide that drugs and vaccines need to be rolled out, how do we allocate that fairly? Who gets to be first and second and third in the queue? Um, what about all the other non-Ebola healthcare needs? The women who apparently are no longer going somewhere to deliver their babies. People are not going for other care because they're scared, understandably, that if they go, they're going to get sick, even for non-Ebola uh, conditions. How can we improve public health cooperation? And I'm going to build a little bit on a few of the things that Tim said, because I'll admit that it has struck me that one of the under-addressed pieces, at least in American media, um, has been what I'll call the public health community local outreach side, which I really am increasingly convinced is going to be our best chance of trying to do something um, in the short run. Um, and then, as Trish said, this um, longstanding, pre-existing um, challenge that already existed in all of these places of health systems and, and infrastructure, and now you put a, put a crisis in, and at very least, um, can there be some very small silver lining that maybe we leave um, the campsite cleaner than we found it? So I'm only going to take on a few of these. I have a few little, I'm just going to jump around to a few of these that I thought would be worth bringing up and we can get to more in the discussion. So in terms of, of global response, here are at least a few statistics that I could find. There was apparent, apparently the first um, person, first child, um, who died from Ebola was in Guinea in December 2013. Um, Doctors Without Borders in March 2014 called for a, a global response, called the outbreak an unprecedented um, crisis. And of course, we all know that in August 2014, two Americans contracted the virus. So um, if you'll bear with me for a little bit of, of um, of, uh, I don't know, weird um, satire and humor. For those of you who read The Onion, there was um, an article that came out last week. With the death toll in West Africa continuing to rise amid a new outbreak of the Ebola, Ebola virus, leading medical experts announced Wednesday that a vaccine for the deadly virus is still at least 50 white people from being developed. <laughs> While all measures are being taken to contain the spread of the contagion, an effective, safe, and reliable Ebola inoculation unfortunately remains roughly to 50, 60 white people away, if not more, said so-and-so, adding that while progress has been made over the course of the last two or three white people, a potential Ebola vaccination is still many more white people away. I'm not going to say any more on that. Um, so um, I want to speak um, a little bit. There's there's a long-standing um, ethics literature on when healthcare professionals have a duty to to care. Um, I'm actually not going to talk um, about that, but I would welcome discussion on it. And I want to focus more on the flip side of that, which is what is it that we owe to the people who are willing to come forward to the to the heroes? And I'm going to expand that um, absolutely not only to doctors and nurses who are so critical, but to the other people who become part of the team. Um, doing Doing functions that um, are, are um, equally critical. So certainly protective equipment um, and training. So part of, again, part of the tragedy of what Trish was describing is that part of it is training or reinforcement or support in having equipment and understanding how to use it in a really safe way. Um, certainly commitments that people who get sick in the course of being a hero get to jump to the front of the line. And again, whether they're going out to a village or they're helping with the people who are deceased or they are a doctor or nurse. 
There was this just um, uh, crazy-making story um, a couple days ago that, that doctors and nurses had been promised hazard pay and overtime pay, and the money wasn't coming through. Literally, these doctors and nurses were not being paid, and they were not coming to work. When you think of what are the gargantuan problems and what are the small problems, that ought to be low-hanging fruit. Um, and places where the international community, even among people who are a little bit anxious about going themselves, ought to be able to help. Um, and then I just want to expand this and really make a note of this, that our duties are to all the people who are helping. There will be so many people at risk. Think of the people whose job it is to clean up the floor in these clinics. And again, I think we've all read some really pretty graphic reports of what is on the floor um, and housekeeping and intake, um, et cetera. Also, I've heard remarkably little, I mean, I'd be interested in the in Trish and other infectious disease specialists take on this, but um, I've heard very little about the role of what I'll call the super survivor, the people who've survived. We, it, there's this horrible statistic of 50 or 60% of people are dying, but that means 40, 50% are, are recovering. And it seems like if they could be part of the teams who are doing the social mobilization and helping with the people who have died, maybe we have a little bit of um, some promise there and give them a ton of money for doing it. Um, should experimental meds be made available? Um, again, for those of you who follow this, particularly from the ethics world, you'll know that not only was um, there all of this particular um, hype and attention to ZMAP that was given to the two Americans who were airlifted home, but the World Health Organization was asked in very short order to have a global ethics consultation in this and concluded that they thought it would be acceptable under certain circumstances to roll out experimental drugs. And that may be an appropriate um, uh, conclusion, but I guess I want to raise that there can be risks to rolling out things that might not work. And it's not simply that we have nothing to lose. We focus, understandably, on the clinical and safety risks, which of course are important and what we must first think about in any experimental drug, particularly one that has never been given to, had never been given to a human being. But again, when we realize, again, thanks in part to what Tim has um, shared with us, what the context is like locally. And already, the clinics are overcrowded and people can't get into so many of them. Um, and if it turns out that we start to give people a medicine and it turns out to be useless, not to mention potentially harmful, but let's assume even simply ineffective, what are the implications of healthcare teams going out and delivering something that doesn't work? Um, and uh, what is the risk of further lack of trust or cooperation with the other messages that have to be communicated and have to be credible? about assembly, about how to handle bodies, um, et cetera. Not to mention um, a, a narrative with which so many of us, sadly, are familiar of, of um, Western people coming in and experimenting on Africans, and that being something that has been um, counterproductive, to say, um, to say the least. Um, I uh, think for the sake of time, I'm going to say very little about allocation of vaccines and drugs once effective. I think the main point I want to make here, I'm just going to make one, um, is to, again, I want us to think about the people we need in a response in a pretty expansive way. Um, and to think absolutely about the doctors and nurses, to think about the people who are willing to go to homes where people have died, to think about the people working in a healthcare facility in all these low paying, bottom of the totem pole jobs where the doctors and nurses can't do what they're doing unless those people are willing to come to work and be, um, and feel safe and feel confident. Um, and then the people who just keep the communities functioning so that there isn't a riot that's unrelated to Ebola in a direct way, but is an indirect response, as we saw with the quarantines in Liberia, et cetera. Um, so then I think I um, just want to spend a couple minutes on, as it turns out, picking up on some of Tim's themes about increasing public health cooperation, which the more I've thought about it over the last few weeks, the it's a, it's a place where I want to sort of put um, some attention. So we have had a lot of reports of people fleeing facilities. And again, this verb is so remarkable. You know, for those of us who think of ourselves as healthcare professionals, people fleeing healthcare, people blocking MSF, who honestly are the hero among heroes here, right? They've been there when nobody else has. Um, blocking their access to communities, people not following directives about assembly or handling of, of bodies. What's going on here? And again, I, Tim has done a beautiful job in illustrating that. It seems to me that one place we need to invest some money and attention and creativity is in what I'll broadly call social science and communication research and trying things out. What messages work? Who do they have to be delivered by? 
What makes a difference if we try it one way or another way? How can we be creative? Again, for those of us, and I think it's many in the room who've worked in broadly in the area of global public health research, we've seen some of what I'll call incredibly creative ways of explaining the rollout of big community-based trials to people through street theater, through information at soccer matches, through things on the radio, things that are a little bit out of our traditional mold. Um, and how can we do that? And how can we get a huge amount of local input into crafting what is right now probably our best magic bullet available? Um, where to from here? Ethics is about trying to get public. Ethicists have the same goal as everybody else, right? Ethicists want to have this um, outbreak managed, have as few people die, have as few people be sick, and have people feel loved and respected and cared for it and be with the people they love and go back to some kind of meaningful life. So there's um, local work, there's global work. The local work I've already just um, mentioned, involving local people with locally relevant messages. And there's a science to that. And there's people around here who are world leaders in that and people who are local who need to be partners. Um, and the global work is in assuring um, that the care will be available. So we need to ensure um, that uh, people that we're able to send the messages out to come for care and follow the directives that we think will make a difference in achieving the public health good. And then we have to be sure that we really can deliver on that and the people who go to the clinic will have something there. And it seems that the global response is starting, but it, from at least the media reports I hear are still pretty far away in getting not only people over there and more equipment, but actually getting dozens more facilities on the ground. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Great. Really, thanks to all three for uh, speaking for not enough time and trying to get the, the conversation going. So given that we now have um, a good 25 minutes to discuss with you all, the onus is on, on you. Um, are we going to have a, a mic stand, Alan and Leah? OK, so I think what we're going to do is have people come line up, rather than my trying to point people out in a big room. Um, and, and when you come up and um, ask your question, identify yourself and um, let everybody know who you are. So hopefully people will have an, in, an interest in coming up and, and making comments. I, I can start um, while we get people queued up. So um, Nancy, you um, mentioned the WHO uh, working group. So say two more sentences about that. In, in August, um, a working group convened by teleconference to discuss the ethics of introduction of experimental therapies. Their report is available online just as of last week, if you're interested in looking at it. Among the things that they suggested would be important, I'm going to now ask you three to think about whether this is possible, and if so, how, was before the introduction of experimental therapies for things like Ebola, but Ebola in particular, there should be, one, informed consent of those who would receive these therapies, consultation with the communities in which the introduction of these therapies would take place, and then third, which is obviously related, is transparency. There were others, but those were three that leapt out to me um, as being really challenging in the context that Ebola and, and other infectious disease outbreaks offer, and in particular, given Tim's brief comments about what uh, work on the ground was like. So in whatever order, maybe just because, Tim, you're closest, you can start. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I won't talk too much about the, um, the, the, the value of those guidelines, but I will say, you know, it would be a shame if this outbreak, and this is, I'm going to make a controversial statement, if this outbreak was remembered as the outbreak where we tested this treatment, you know? It's, and it would be a shame if the attention was put on, well, how are we going to roll out this and how are we going to recruit people and how are we going to do this? You know, perhaps that needs to happen. But there's a big issue here, and that is that people are dying and in ways that can be prevented. So um, I think we can talk about this, but remember that it may be secondary. So you're okay. So you're you're dodging my question, but that's okay because there are many other people who want to ask questions. If any of the three of you want to speak to the to the points that I made, feel free. Um, I would just say one thing, and I think um, whatever is done, it is incumbent upon all of us to make sure that transparency 
but also scientific rigor is incorporated into the process. And what we learned from SARS is that a lot of people got steroids and they ultimately ended up hurting people. And there was really never a public accounting of why and how that happened. And so more and more, there's been a lot of pressure on the international community, particularly WHO, because many of us feel this is a role they need to take. But we need to integrate whatever we do into a scientific framework to make sure that we do not do harm. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. OK, please. Okay. Uh, Gilbert Burnham, and I just wanted to make a, a quick observation about the subject of hazard pay and overtime pay and so forth. Just to put this in context, most of these health workers, if they're like health workers in other places in Africa, probably haven't been paid in six months or a year. And the way they survive is having a second job. And now in their situation where they can't work on their second job, they have a stigma for working in this kind of situation, it has really kind of cut off all kind of financial support uh, to families. And so that makes a huge difference to these populations. Now we have, uh, we have already started seeing cash vouchers being used in uh, the, uh, the, the families and the communities that have been affected. And using these kind of cash vouchers for, for hospital employees, I think is a, a, something I haven't seen tested yet. And it has a lot of kind of ethical implications about you know paying people to do their job, paying people who are in the key positions and those who aren't in the key positions. And I think that's something that seriously needs to be looked at. Thank you. Stephanie, yes. Unless others, do you, anybody want to respond to that? We have a lot of people lined up. Good. All right. Stephanie, Hi, uh, Stephanie Marine, a Heck Levy Fellow from the Berman Institute. And I was hoping some of you could speak about this challenge of who should be making these decisions related to experimental use of therapy or other decisions. There's been a lot of pushback on WHO to be stepping up to take the role, but I know in the U.S. we've had this ongoing debate because people are coming forward for experimental treatments and demanding it in the courts, and we've historically not had a great experience with courts making good decisions. So wondering kind of who's the appropriate decision-making authority given the international challenges. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll take a stab at it, Stephanie, and you know, in certain ways I don't know. I mean, I, I actually think that WHO was doing I think the right thing by trying to convene a global panel and getting global input on a question like that. Um, they understandably got criticism that there was only one African, if I remember correctly, somebody from the Ugandan regulatory agency who was on the panel after the panel met. I got a bunch of emails, I assume lots of other people do, trying to, um, looking for people from West Africa, as we already heard from Trish, the number of people trained in West Africa is small. It, it seems that it, um, I, I am a believer, I think this is the kind of thing where WHO is relevant, and obviously in partnership with, with um, some people uh, locally, figuring out whether it's reasonable uh, for them. But you know, when, when you're in an emergency context, it makes sense that you want to push the boundaries of risk and benefit and, and push the question of what, whether our traditional rules apply. We have rules for this. But the point here is that people are wondering whether this is a case to push them, uh, move, move the needle to a different place. Uh, Ted Bailey, I'm a fellow with the Heck Levy uh, Bioethics Program. Uh, a question that came up, and this is largely because of Tim's comment about how practically essential it is to take actions that nurture and sustain trust and avoid those that undermine it. Certain things that have been in the media and have come up in other epidemic contexts are the use of compulsory course of public health measures, things that might be trial restrictions, quarantine, isolation, work restrictions, things like that. Uh, those things seem to be a delicate balance, a difficult juggling act here. But if they threaten credibility, threaten trust, how do you think about whether substantively or procedurally the possible introduction and governance of those kinds of measures at this point in time or in the near future? <laughs> it was directed at you, but others can, can chime yeah. in too. Yeah, thanks for your question. That's a, that's a great question. I, um, it's a tricky question. I mean, there's the, the, the biggest example of this so far is in Monrovia, right? The, the, the control of people in that slum, I suppose, there. And I don't know whether it's really been that effective. I mean, it would be great to have some research around whether or not uh, that's actually reduced the spread of the disease. I don't know how we figure that out. Or whether or not it's just contributed to more spread within the people in that, um, in that area. I mean, kind of 
another thing to remember is this, this, this outbreak happened right on the border of three countries. And also, there's an, there are ethnic groups or cultural groups who straddle those borders right there. So if you were trying to set up an, a boundary, like an absolute concrete boundary, you're talking about preventing people from traveling back and forth from villages to where they usually are, which perhaps you could say is necessary because it's an extreme you know, situation, but I, I really question whether that's going to be helpful or not. Um. I guess the, the only thing I'll build on from what Tim said is it seems that it's not going to be good to um, perpetuate any kind of narrative that says people um, are being penalized rather than cared for. Now, obviously, we find ourselves in a far from ideal situation where there's inadequate care, right? There's just not enough people on the ground that we've already heard, talked about that. Um, but something that looks punitive rather than compassionate um, seems to, throughout the history of public health, to be counterintuitive, right? I mean, we have good examples back from syphilis days of how saying to people, come forward without penalty, and that was the strategy to try to um, prevent further spread. Um, there, there apparently, I, I haven't actually seen much of the news that um, President Obama has um, said something that there's going to be military being sent to um, to West Africa in the context of Ebola, and I need to find. I am e extremely uninformed about this. But when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, I hope it's the part of the groups who are set up to do medical bio. You know, b there are groups within the military that are um, equipped to do this kind of thing, and there are other groups within the military who are um, equipped to do um, containment. And I certainly hope it's the former. Yeah, I, I would just add on because I think you've addressed or identified one of the issues we need to think about. And the reality is that many of us are extremely worried that in this particular outbreak, there has potentially been enough, um, there's a high enough prevalence in the community that we could perpetuate transmission for a while and we could have a significant number of cases. So we are walking into an outbreak that is quite mature. And given the um, consequences of this particular infection and already some of the economic instability as well as even the political instability that has been witnessed, do we need to rethink a little bit our public, how, how we approach it from a public health point of view? And actually, to Nancy's point, do we need to have more of a very structured response like you see in the setting of, of, of the military? And you know, I'm far from a person who would normally advocate that, but I recognize that a, a command and control structure <clears throat> that is really integrating a lot of the response and making sure that it is cohesive may be an important control measure that is needed to really abort the transmission uh, cycles that are going on. And DA Henderson is in the back there, but I think you know, when you talk to him about what was needed with smallpox, there were actually pretty draconian things that were required. Hi, I'm Radha Rajan, um, a doctoral student in Health Behavior and Society at the School of Public Health. I um, was interested in kind of when you mentioned the idea of trust building as a communication strategy that's really important in a crisis, how that kind of fits with the type, the timeline of a crisis, and usually that being something that takes time to, to develop. And so, you know, hoping that this outbreak ends and kind of foreseeing that there's probably another outbreak at some time in the future, um, with a public health workforce that's stretched pretty thin, volunteers that don't necessarily get paid and have other jobs or things to go back to. Um, how does how does your thinking kind of guide what happens in the meanwhile to continue that trust building? Yeah, that's a good one for Tim. OK. Well, one of the things we saw that was seemed to be effective, or at least people were telling us was effective, was incorporating uh, local leaders into the strategy. 
and using them as advocates and as the sort of communication sources and channels to, to spread the word. For example, um, you know, getting at the village level, village chiefs on board, getting, pe getting people, local politicians on board, getting in particular local religious leaders on board because, you know, you understand at burial time, you know, there's a lot of faith-based implications there. And, to, and for your r religious leader in your community to say, no, 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 it's okay if you let the Red Cross come in and do this, and then you can pray over the body from a distance. You know, just having their support and um, you know redoubling the communication, I think, is really valuable and, and helps to, to build trust. And unfortunately, uh, perhaps that wasn't done as much in this outbreak. Although certainly when I was there, it was being it was being that was the, one of the key strategies. In fact, there was a village there that had for a month refused to have anybody come in to the village. And so what the people on the ground were doing was collecting or putting together a delegation that involved politicians, religious leaders, local people. And then there was a time set aside where they would travel to that village and they would sit down and they would just talk and talk about, you know, what it means for them, what it means for the other community um, to, to prevent the spread of the disease. So I think there are techniques. It, it takes time, but I think there are immediate things that you can do, you know, um, and the, the, yeah. So. Les. Len. Uh, Len, Len Rubenstein from the Bloomberg School and the Berman Institute. I'd like you to reflect on how the international community, the bioethics community, the media looked at the ethical issues over the last two months. And to be provocative, it seems that six weeks, four or six weeks ago, there were three huge issues, some of which were on Nancy's slide. One was the inadequate response, the role of WHO, problematic, and why it was so problematic. The second was the uh, experiment on the, with the drugs and whether it should be Americans alone. And the third was the immediate imposition of highly coercive um, quarantine measures, which seem to have been very destructive and undermined social mobilization, driving people underground. The only issue that got attention four to six weeks ago what was the uh, experimentation and the drug. The other issues really didn't... Um, get any attention except for Lori Garrett on WHO and a few others. The coercive uh, quarantines have gotten almost no attention, although they seem to be quite, quite harmful. So could you reflect on, on the process of what gets attention and compared to what's important? I'm not saying that the drug issue isn't important, but I'd like to hear your thoughts about those issues. It's a, it's, a, it's a fabulous question, Len. Um, so, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I have no idea why, but I'll give you two, two thoughts that occur to me. One is um, <laughs> everybody in public health knows that it's harder to explain public health to people and what it does than medicine. Everybody is familiar with pills for diseases, and many fewer people are familiar with what is a bit more complex about messaging and protections and measures and local people and social mobilization, and it's a more complex story. And so I think that's part of it, is that people could get it. I also think, um, at least, so I'm sure all of us have been involved in some amount of media interviews over the last few weeks, and I feel like a question that I got all the time was, why did the Americans get it and the Africans didn't? And I actually think that people were feeling that they were being very globally conscious in asking that kind of question. Now again, I would go back to number one, which is I think people maybe just don't know enough, and, and you know, maybe as public health people we haven't pushed the narrative in non-crisis times of what really makes a difference in prevention and care. So I don't think that people were aware of those three issues and picked the ZMAP one. I think everybody saw Kent Brantley and Nancy Wrightbull get off the plane and go and get this treatment and in what felt like a very compassionate sense said, so why not the Africans? So that's my, my, my take on it. Next, please. Yeah, Neil Halsey, a pediatrician in infectious disease and at the Bloomberg School of Public Health who's worked on vaccines for a number of years. I have two comments, both related to things that Tim said. Um, first, you outlined that this outbreak will be controlled with public health measures, but none of you have really outlined the basic strategy and the impl implementation of that strategy and the ethical problems. You've hinted at them and gone around. 
but it is identifying the contacts who have already been exposed, preventing them from transmitting to other people, which does mean that they need to be in a co coercive manner prevented from having contact with others, which creates enormous problems which have been difficult to implement, more difficult in this outbreak than in any of the previous ones, including the economic issues of people slipping up because they have to go to work. But So somebody should spend a little more time talking about that because that is the strategy that will work. The second point, you said it would be a shame if this was the outbreak remembered when people evaluated some intervention. I think it'd be a shame to not evaluate them, as Trish pointed out. You can't just go out and roll them out, which there will be enormous pressure. What is really needed is to outline in detail what the appropriate ethical and scientifically correct methods are to evaluate the different products, drug treatment, passive antibody, the ZMAP, and vaccines. And there are strategies that can be implemented to do that in an ethical manner in the middle of an epidemic. And I don't see that anybody has laid that out. Neil, thank you as always for a provocative, great question. Um, so, so I'm gonna make a general comment first, which is um, I think one of the biggest challenges in ethics, and I'm sure this is true for other areas as well, is thinking about what's right ethical behavior in a background context that so many of us would agree is unethical, right? So there is um, injustice in the way the world deals with public health and how many people have education, how many people have training, how many people get paid for their jobs. I mean, before Ebola hit, there were so many things going on that people from the outside would look at in, so in these most deeply affected environments and say, if you're trying to think about an ethical way to manage, to, to structure a world or a society, it would not look like this. And then we sort of, a little bit in a vacuum, do have some language and narrative and thinking about what are the most ethical ways to uh, manage public health isolation and quarantine. I mean, you know, Kent Brantley came to Grady Hospital in Atlanta and essentially was in isolation, right? But nobody looked at that and said, oh my gosh, the poor, you know, he's being exploited, he's being abused, it's terrible, because of the context, right? And not only because of of communication and transparency, but because it was so clear that all of the things that should be put in place, like he could hold hands with his wife through a barrier and all sorts of things like that, where he had plenty of food, he had plenty of water. I mean, all sorts of things that we wanna put in place if we're going to impose a public health restriction on somebody else. All the guarantees of decency that we have an ethical duty to provide in any kind of public health isolation and context can be provided in Atlanta and aren't gonna be provided here. So I agree with you. I guess I'll, what I'll say is what we need to do is, is put these layers together and think about what is our most ethical response and how can we have an ethically acceptable response when we need to do isolation in an environment where the healthcare workers aren't even getting paid and don't always have enough of what they need and we have to guarantee that to the people or of course we're not gonna be either humane or get the public health cooperation we need. It's layering the context with traditional ethical norms for those situations. No. Yeah, I don't think I can be quite as elegant, uh, eloquent as Nancy was, but I think one of the things that I've really been struck by is that this reminds me a lot of what it felt like during the emergence of HIV. And where you saw a disease where there was a huge fear of the disease and the disease process itself, a lot of misconceptions about the disease, a lot of um, educational issues, and a lot of misinformation uh, about transmission, et cetera. And, and hence, there is a lot of isolation associated with not only the care of these patients, but also how the healthcare workers feel as they're con uh, as they're caring for them. And I use healthcare in the very, very general sense, the burial boys, I mean, all of people who are impacted by all of this. So I actually feel very much like we need to take a step back and think about what did we learn when, 
when HIV emerged and what kind of moral construct do we need to be developing to integrate into the public health response as well as into the clinical care response. Tim. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to take the opportunity to, to respond a little, a little bit to your comments. Um, when I said this question now about um, you know, not it being seen as the outbreak where we test this treatment. I guess what I'm, just to clarify what I'm saying is, you know, we shouldn't be doing this, um, putting our, redirecting resources to this at the expense of controlling the outbreak. Um, because I think it would be a shame if that's in 10 years time, that's how this was remembered. You know, that this was an, an, an outbreak where the Americans came in and tested their treatment. You know, meanwhile, however many people think, I don't think that's the case. And I agree with you though, that this is an opportunity to do that, so point taken. Um, your initial point, though, about using perhaps there is a time when coercion is necessary involved in contract tracing, I think this is a really like, a difficult issue because even already people are afraid to go to the health centre if they're starting to get feverish. You know, what if there were punitive measures for being feverish? What if, what if you, you know, simply by, by um, you know, coming to the health centre that your family was then going to be rounded up and taken, you know, for isolation. I think, um, I think it's very difficult, perhaps there are ways to do it, but I wonder whether we really have any experience of this, because in format outbreaks we've often had a vaccine or we've, it's involved different strategies. So. I think if you look carefully at the history of smallpox, DA Henderson is here, he should be able to comment. And if you look at what happened with SARS, I mean, you have to do that. That's what's not being done. That's why the transmission is continuing. You have to prevent, if you're going to use public health measures, it is preventing the continued transmission, identifying those contacts and preventing those contacts from transmitting to others. Otherwise, it's just going to go on. And you do then need to bring in the ethical way in order to do that. These people can't afford not to work for a day. They can't. And so you have to pay them, which is what was learned in smallpox. I mean, I know some of the people who did it. I wasn't involved, but I know some of the people who figured that out not too far into the, you know, uh, interventions. Well, I'm, I'm watching the clock, so I want to be really cognizant of the fact that we get people out at 1.15. Yeah, I was going to say, that was exactly what I was going to do. Um, is, is, DA, are you willing to say two words? We can bring a microphone to wherever you are. I actually don't see where you are in the room. So as Nancy runs the microphone back, I think one of the takeaways from today is this is a very complicated discussion that we are only just beginning to have. So, ah, so DA is not here. I didn't see him either. I didn't see him. Who said? Well, he's an appropriate, DA Henderson is a very appropriate person to invoke in this conversation. If he were here, he would have great insights for us. Um, all right. On that, on that funny note, um, we, we are beginning a conversation which is very challenging, obviously, and deserves much more attention. And we will hopefully continue to have these conversations in various groups. Thank you all three for your comments. Thank you all for your attendance. And, and let, me, let me just remind everybody the next Berman Institute seminar is the 22nd of September. Same time, but in a different room in Wolf Street, W3008. So we hope to see you all there. Oh, oh. Really? I'm wrong. Fine, Fine Stone Hall, even more confusing. So 22nd and Fine Stone Hall in Wolf Street. Did you get one?